Money and Relationships this week. I like to call this Pete's Money School. I kind of like to call the show Pete's Money School. It's uh, teaching everything you need to know about money, uh, the non-math part. We talk about math sometimes, but money's behavior, money's relationships. And this week we talk relationships. I'm recording this entire show this week uh, via video. I'm going to post it at youtube.com slash Pete the Planner. If you ever wondered what it looks like when I do the show, well, you're about to see. You can see my lovely face. It's not that great. In fact, if you're watching the video, I'm sorry. There's just not much to look at here. Uh, I'm a ginger, but I know a thing or two. All right, so money and relationships. Let's go back to the idea of should you have one checking account or two? I remember in my first book uh, called What Your Dad Never Taught You About Budgeting, I had a line, something that said the fact of, if you don't trust your spouse with money, then you don't trust your spouse. It's a nice, it, you can see it like on a successories poster. There's like a, uh, like a, crane trying to swallow a frog and the frog's not going in there. It's like, it's like, it's a little too convenient, right? What I'm saying is it's a little too convenient to think of, if you don't trust your spouse with money, you don't trust your spouse. My wife does not trust me to do surgery on her. My wife does not trust me to repair anything in her house, but she trusts me. So if you don't trust someone with money, I, I think it's okay. Now you don't want to lose faith in them. I think that's where you go to the next step. If you lose faith in your partner financially, that's a problem. If you don't trust them, not necessarily a problem. You just have to run your life accordingly. So here's where my wife and I have arrived. Uh, we have separate checking accounts, but both accounts are both our money. It's the separate but our. Here's why. I'm on the road all the time. And last week alone, I was in New York, Philadelphia, Washington, Madison, Wisconsin, San Diego, LA, and Indianapolis. That was in a six-day time frame. So I'm all over the place. And if I happen to be spending money for whatever reasons, and my wife is back at home with the kids spending money, logistically, the number of transactions and the, the amount of accounting that's involved with that, in my opinion, is too much. So what we've chosen to do is we both have access to each other's checking accounts, uh, but we have uh, two checking accounts. Mine pays the mortgage, the health insurance, the groceries and the food, Hers pays the utilities and sort of lifestyle stuff for the kids. That's it. Both accounts, uh, we have investments and savings coming out of them. Uh, again, I pay the health insurance. I think her account pays the car insurance. So it, it, it works. And because we don't have to seek permission from each other to spend money, and because we know we're going to talk about it every month anyway, it works really well for us. I find that works especially well for couples that have come together later in life. Now, Mrs. Planner and I got married when we were 22. We were broke, we were young, I had more hair, less facial hair, but I had more hair on my head. And uh, so we've been together since day one. But I find if you are getting married late your 20s or 30s, or even just getting into a relationship, it has nothing to do with marriage. I find that it is much harder to go to one checking account the older you are when you get married. Because your habits, uh, are, are what you have leaned on uh, your entire time. So don't, don't think if you get married that that means, okay, well, it's time to join our finances via a checking account. That's not, not the case, in my opinion. You should join your finances in terms of being on the same page, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be in the same checking account. I did want to do uh, sort of a tips-based idea here. I, I don't like five tips for doing this, but I'm gonna give you five tips for doing this. And it, the, the this is staying married <laughs> or staying in your relationship and relatively happy. These are based on the, so I've talked to about 25,000 people uh, about their financial lives independently. And the, so th these are sort of my best five tips based on things I've seen. Number one out the gate. So again, we're gonna call these five financial tips for staying married and in a relationship and relatively happy. Yeah, it's clean, right? Uh, number one, do not punish your partner by spending money. Oh, man. Well, you went to play golf, so I'm going to go shopping. Okay, that's a terrible idea. Right? No, many, no matter what end of that uh, equation you're on, oh, you went to a candle party at your friend's house and were awkwardly talked into buying candles, so I'm going to go out and have some beers. No. Do not punish your partner by spending money. If one person did something that someone thinks is subjectively a bad idea, 
you can't fix it by doing something equally as stupid on the other side. It's very childish and, oddly enough, very, very common. Yeah, it's really common for people to revenge spend. Do not revenge spend. Now, if you want to have a, an, I think this is silly, but if you want to do it, it's better than revenge spending. If you want to have an allowance, if you want to have an allowance system where you can take 200 bucks a month and do whatever you want with it, and you can take 200 bucks and do whatever you want with it, that's fine because it prevents revenge spending, generally. I will say, I, I never believe in the allowance system when there's consumer debt in the household. You know, people are like, well, my allowance this week's 200 or this month's 200 bucks. I'm going to go do this and that. And it's like, well, dude, you got four grand in credit card debt. I don't think an allowance is a good move. I think you guys should work together to pay off your debt. Oddly enough, in the next segment, we're going to talk about uh, setting goals together. How do you set financial goals together? Because I think a lot of times uh, people butcher that. Number two on the list of how do, uh, what are we calling this thing? Five financial tips for staying married or in a relationship and relatively happy. Number two, don't have a spontaneous money conversation. I've mentioned this one in the past. I, I believe it. I think it is a terrible idea to have a spontaneous money conversation. Let's say you're listening to this right now and you're thinking, man, you know what? I think this dude's right. You need to go on the same page as my lovey-dovey. Don't go home and, and start the conversation. That's a terrible idea. It's an awful idea. Here's what I'd prefer you to do. I prefer you to go home and say, you know what? I was listening to a radio show and we're talking about or whatever, a podcast or a video on YouTube. And I got the idea that maybe we should get on the same page financially. Can we talk about this this coming weekend? That's what you should do. Plan your money conversations. Do not put anyone, do not put baby in a corner, I believe was said in Dirty Dancing. No one puts baby in a corner. Do not make someone react to your structured thoughts right because if you if you've been thinking about this money meeting and you bring it on them and all of a sudden it starts they've got no ammo and you're just blasting them terrible idea dude don't do it or do that i don't judge so at least set it for a few days out set a time for it hey how about 10 a.m on saturday we talk about this it works i highly encourage you to never have a spontaneous money conversation only have proactive conversations. Number three on our fancy tips of what we're calling this week uh, on the Pizza Planner Show, five financial tips for staying married and or in a relationship and relatively happy. Number uh, three, do not borrow money from your parents. Now, I, I, I feel this way in a lot of respects, but I can tell you when you're married and you borrow money from someone's parents, all sorts of weird psychological stuff goes on. I can't explain any of it to you. I really can't, but I know what it looks like. And and pride is involved, and uh, gender communication and relationships involved. I, I can I can just tell you when a couple is struggling and one person goes and seeks the help of a parent, it can get really weird and really awkward. I never like intergenerational financial relationships anyway. Uh, but in this circumstance, I think it can do serious damage to a marriage when you get help from a parent, especially if the other spouse or the other person in the relationship isn't on board. Number four, which we're talking about all next uh, segment here, work hard to develop joint financial goals. This is a lot harder than you think. That's why I say work hard. It's really hard because a lot of joint financial goals end up being purchase goals. Hey, we're going to save money so we can buy a new couch. Oh, we're going to save money so we can redo the basement. We're going to save money so we can go on vacation. All of those are purchase slash consumption goals and don't really move you forward financially. Not a single one of those other than maybe finishing the basement increases your net worth. Your net worth, of course, is a measure of your assets minus your debts. And when you put the two together, you get your net worth. Assets minus debts. And so, in my opinion, financial goals, most of them, should consist of moving your net worth forward, not consuming things or acquiring things. A lot of people in their 30s, early 30s, go through this stuff accumulation phase. You just get a bunch of stuff. Hey, I got stuff. I got more stuff. So don't be that person or couple. 
Number five of my, what are we calling these? We're calling these the five financial tips for staying married or in a relationship and relatively happy. Uh, number one, by the way, we'll re review. This is called a recap in the biz. Don't punish your partner by spending money, so that's no revenge spending. Number two is don't ever have a spontaneous money conversation. Always have a proactive money conversation. Number three, don't borrow money from your parents. <laughs> oh. Number four, work hard to develop financial goals, joint financial goals, and we'll talk about that next. And finally, don't have a secret account. I shouldn't have to tell you this, right? Don't have a secret savings account. Don't have a secret credit card account. And a lot of people do. Now, I will say, if you've got someone as a member of your relationship who is struggling financially and does a lot of very destructive things, uh, the secret savings account is sometimes used for emergencies that the other person can't have the forethought to uh, think about, actually. And so that uh, secret emergency fund saves the day, saves the bacon, so to speak. Uh, now, the secret, the secret credit card account's crazy. You know where secret credit card accounts often start, in my mind, are with engagements. That someone, because I can say men here, because I, I, I try to be very sensitive to uh, different uh, types of relationships, but I can say in most cases, uh, a man is gonna propose, women propose too sometimes, but a lot of times a guy will buy a ring and then he doesn't have the money to ring, so he, he gets a credit card for the ring, but doesn't wanna admit that he didn't have money for the ring, and that is the uh, catalyst and the origin story, the genesis of the secret credit card, is that a guy or whoever doesn't wanna admit that they didn't have money for a ring, so they finance it, and then they never tell them because they're embarrassed. Yeah. So there they are, my five tips on uh, uh, staying married or relatively happy. Again, to review, don't punish your partner by spending money. Uh, that's revenge spending. Don't ever have a spontaneous money conversation. Don't borrow money from your parents. Work hard to develop a joint financial goals. And finally, don't have a secret account. Coming up after the break, more on joint financial goals, how to develop them, because we all have different opinions. Uh, so how can we get on the same page and do things together? That's next. I'm Pete the Planner.